Welcome back, and we're now entering our final unit of the survey. The next two classes are comparative. We're going to look first at the interwar Soviet Jewish experience, and then we're going to compare it to the interwar Polish Jewish experience, including Galicia. Galicia, remember, is part of interwar Poland. And then we'll end on the Holocaust and have a particular look at the nature of the Holocaust, specifically in Eastern Europe and especially, especially Poland and, and Galicia. But first, we want to look at the interwar Soviet experience. What was unique about it? What was going on during those 20 or so years? Uh, recall the intense anti-Jewish persecution going on during the Civil Wars after the First World War for a couple years, and that one of the main exceptions to that was the Red Army. The Red Army, headed by Trotsky, was quite punctilious in suppressing any kind of anti-Jewish violence. And from, 19, from November of 1917, partially because of that, the revolution is in some ways identified with the Jews, many on the right see Bolshevism as the creation of the Jews, as another form of Jewish conspiracy to dominate the world. And this is reinforced by the fact that there are these prominent Jews in the Bolshevik movement, uh, above all Leon Trotsky's. If you wanted to believe it, if you wanted to believe it, you can try to find facts that were available for, the, for, that, for that purpose, for that conspiratorial mindset, despite the fact that these Jews, people like Trotsky, had totally renounced their Jewishness. Nevertheless, with the revolution, the great hope for many Jews and this new society reshaping itself based on ideas of a socialist, classless society would be the hope for the future. And Jews would, as we'll see, see remain mostly patriotic and supportive of the regime through the interwar period. Now, generally, historiography divides interwar Soviet experience into three periods. First of all, war communism, the first few years of the Civil War and just after. Um, also, this is a period where they're searching for a solution to the issue of nationalities. And then, second of all, the NEP, the New Economic Policy, from about 1921 until about 1927-28. This is the notion of socialism from above, but capitalism from below. Essentially, a period of compromise where there would be continued toleration of different national minorities and institutions created in their tongues and their languages, Jews will be an exception, as we'll see, to a certain extent. But there's also an allowance for a certain degree of, of economic activity in which Jews are highly involved. And then finally, beginning around 1928, the industrialization and, and collectivization. Um, Stalin is now beginning his campaign against nationalist deviations, and we begin to see the eclipse of all national autonomy, especially for the extraterritorial national minorities. Uh, these are more or less the three periods we're going to look at, although we're going to divide it a little bit differently, as you can see here. We're going to look, first of all, at the era of revolutions, the era of the first few years of the Soviet regime, and then we'll take a look at various facets of the interwar Jewish experience in the Soviet Union, interwar religious life, cultural life, and especially economic change and social restructuring. So let's dive right in. Uh, recall the experiment in the Ukraine, it, the short-lived Ukrainian state of full national minority rights. This lasts about a year until the Ukrainian state collapses into civil war and pogroms, and ultimately, of course, it's conquered by the Red Army. There are also experiments in various Baltic states, in Lithuania until 1925, in Latvia until a fascist coup in 1934, and in Estonia until Soviet conquest all the way till 1940, Poland is its own story. We'll come back to that later. In the Soviet Union, there was a different story. You know, the Soviet Union has a certain nationality theory, and both Lenin and Stalin consistently denied the existence of the Jewish nationality. Stalin defined nationality as, as follows, quote, a nationality is a fixed human community existing historically on the basis of a common language, a common territory, a common economic structure, and a psychic structure expressed in a common culture. So again, a common language, territory, economic structure, and psychic structure. And Jews fail at least one of those tests for sure, namely a common territory and possibly others. But in practice, despite that fact that Stalin and Lenin really did not imagine Jews as a nationality, it's the reason why 
the Bund was excluded, uh, was, not in, was not accepted as its own group before the First World War. In practice, Jews were early on, in fact, yes, designated as a nationality and a policy that guaranteed autonomy and freedom development to all nationalities, at least on, on paper. Lenin was especially concerned with anti-Semitism. Remember the, the behavior of the Red Army because anti-Semitism really could be used as a weapon of the counter-revolutionary forces. Uh, in November of 1917, they declared the rights, there's a declaration of the rights of nationalities issued by the Council of People's Commissars, and this includes the Jews. It even promised the right of secession, which is meaningless to Jews as an extraterritorial minority, but theoretically their right was there. And the idea was that the best way to placate national strife was to promise national rights, a very short-lived idea. By 1923, the nationalities were instructed by the Commissar for Public Enlightenment that education must refrain from teaching history in a way that stimulated children's national pride. Already in 1923, they're concerned about the danger of nationalism as a counter-revolutionary force. And the purpose of all of this uh, uh, sort of uh, concessions to nationalism was expressed uh, in, a, in a phrase later explicitly so, nationalism in form, socialist in content. Nationalist in form, socialist in content. Using the form of nationalism, the language of the nationalities, speaking in, in a way that various national groups can understand, but instilling in them a socialist content to transform them and ultimately fuse all the Soviet peoples into a common socialist culture. The goal was, in the case of the Jews, assimilation. It was not just regeneration or productivization. These are ideals we've been seeing as part of the discourse of emancipation for 150 years, but rather assimilation. That was the goal, nationalist in form, socialist in content. And for that purpose, they established Jewish sections of the Communist Party known as Evsekzias. And these are headed by a Jewish department of the Commissariat for Nationality Affairs called Evcom. And this commissariat established by, by Stalin, headed by Stalin, I should say, 1918 already. This is not the Bund. Uh, this is quite different than the Bund. The FCOM, both FCOM and the Efsexias are officially assimilationist. The Bund, we call, was a Jewish nationalist organization. These are officially assimilationist. Uh, that's, that's their purpose. Uh, in fact, uh, only 5% of the nearly 50,000 Jewish party members in 1927 were part of the Efsexia. Uh, this is something different than what we've seen before. Uh, EFCOM's main tasks during its brief existence from 1918 to 1924 were as follows, to fight and destroy Zionist and especially Jewish socialist parties. The latter were much more important to be destroyed than the former. To conduct propaganda in Yiddish to integrate the Jewish masses into the new regime to advise central and local institutions on all questions connected with the Jews, to set up Jewish institutions to carry out the Soviet government's policy, and to help Jewish refugees return to their previous homes and give economic assistance. A very practical purpose of resettling the Jews and integrating them into the new Soviet state. The first thing the Jewish communists did was to persuade the government to dissolve all of the kahilas. This is granted quite easily. In June 1919, all Jewish communal organizations are abolished. And it was justified by writing that these organizations were grouped around the enemies of the working class and the enemies of the revolution. Their educational work was nurturing an anti-proletarian spirit, according to, uh, to their complaint, and they were very quickly uh, dissolved. All communal possessions are expropriated, including funds and property of organizations like Ekapo, Oret, and so on, important health organization of the, of the Jews at the time. Uh, these are hardships because the state could not quickly assume the social welfare functions that the communities had overdone. They dissolved the communities, they dissolved these charitable organizations, but they're not able yet to handle the load of what they were doing. They were especially interested in destroying religious institutions and in shutting down all competing political organizations, uh, as was the Soviet state as a whole during this time. And they pushed uh, ultimately successfully, although not immediately, to outlaw all existing Jewish parties, especially the Zionists, who by 1918 had gained about 300,000 followers and 1,200 groups. Uh, 
300,000 followers and 1,200 groups, the most potent force in Jewish public life at the, at, the, uh, at the start of the revolution. When the Soviet Union is formed in 1924, the Commissariat for Nationality Affairs is abolished. It's a Jewish section along with all the others. And all that remains now are the local Yevsexia groups. They're going to last all the way until 1930 when they're dissolved along with other national groups, as we'll see because of Stalin's increasing power. He no longer needs to make these concessions to national minorities. We'll come back to that in a little while. And Jews and other national, national, other national minorities uh, will have lost their sole representative in the central government. Uh, the Soviet state, just keep in mind, as, as you all know, is a totalitarian regime, a one-party state. That means, in fact, it's probably the most successful totalitarian, totalitarian regime of, of any of the interwar uh, governments. All competing parties, cultural and social organizations, all must be destroyed. This takes time to achieve, almost a decade, uh, and it's going to be accomplished with the Jews via the Yevsexia. The Yevsexia will be, the, the Jewish section of the Communist Party will be the group to destroy all of the other competing cultural and political and social organizations uh, until it itself is also then destroyed in the 1930s. Zionism, which was a major target of the Yevsexia, was outlawed. 3,000 Zionist leaders are arrested, many of them sent to Siberia, and other Zionist parties, labor Zionist parties and so on, and other Jewish political groups like the Bund and the Focus were ultimately banned as well. The Bund will be forced to merge with the communists in 1921. There's simply no room for political diversity. This is a totalitarian regime. But what's interesting is that for the state, unlike for the Yevsexias, Zionism was quite peripheral. Actually, it survives in its labor forms into the 1920s. Unlike the Bund, the Bund must be destroyed immediately for the state, a competing socialist group. But for the state, Zionism was more peripheral. For the Yevsexias, it was much more central. In fact, the Hebrew theater company, Habima, lasts all the way until 1926. Hundreds of Zionists are sent to Siberia, it's true, but they're going to be permitted to renounce their Soviet citizenship and emigrate to Palestine in the 1920s, something unimaginable 10 years later. And during the NEP, they're, allowed, they're allowing foreign agencies like the Joint Distribution Committee to send relief to specifically Jewish welfare projects because they brought in foreign currency. The fact is that during the 1920s, the regime was far more concerned with combating anti-Semitism, which had been so effectively exploited by the White Army in raising anti-Bolshevik threat, than they were in combating Zionism. This pattern is totally reversed in the years just before World War II, or I should say rather its, uh, uh, its opposition to anti-Semitism is reversed in the years just before World War II, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Let's talk about religious life in the interwar period. There's a decree in 1919, it lasts all the way until 1929, that restricts various religious, religious activities. Importantly, especially religious instruction is forbidden in any school, public or private. Uh, I'll nuance that in a moment. Uh, you couldn't propagate religion in any form. You were free to spread anti-religious propaganda, but religious propaganda was prohibited. And this brings us back to the Yevsexia, because without a doubt, the, it was the most important Jewish organization established, and its goal was to Bolshevize the Jews. They want to create a Bolshevik Jewish culture. There is a new contract of regeneration, not like the ones we saw before. They want to reshape the Jews with the rest of the Soviet population, and they were most effective at efforts of destruction, destroying old institutions of Jewish life, and that brings us back to the issue of religious life. Most synagogues and religious institutions are eliminated. They're converted into clubhouses. You can see the image there. Uh, not all of them. We now know, uh, because of some research I'll mention later on, that in 1929, there were still 500 legal synagogues in white Russia, almost 1,000 in Ukraine, and we'll come back to that. Uh, but Kheders and Yeshivot were completely suppressed, completely shut down, the religious leaders arrested, religious books confiscated, as you can see in the picture. It, this propaganda poster is just one of my favorite. It gives a sense of the kind of transformation the Yevsexia, with, as, as the arm of the state, are trying to accomplish. The, the Yiddish in the middle says, the old school had slaves, the red school prepares healthy, work-ready people built from the socialist order. And you have your choice of paths. On the left is the cheder. The cheder leads to shopkeeping, synagogue, and ethnic hatred.
And on the right, you have the red school with the healthy, well-dressed, modern-looking kids and teacher. This leads to factory work, agriculture, and ethnic brotherhood. In other words, regeneration. Uh, now, we know uh, that they had enough teachers and interest to consider to continue existing after their ban. In other words, the haters are continuing in Ukraine into the, through the 1920s, and that's the reason why the, you have to have this kind of propaganda trying to stop it. Uh, the campaign stepped up in the 19, around 1928. Uh, there was actually, a, I have to mention this, it's just one of the, I, I, for personal reasons, I happen to find it fascinating. There was a, a, there's a group called the League of the Godless, established in 1925. They have 200,000 Jewish members by 1929, and their newsletter obviously called Der Apikairis, the Heretic, uh, which is just a phenomenally perfect name for such a newsletter. It's a Yiddish, Yiddish Aramaic word, um, the Heretic. We're the heretic against Jewish, against Judaism, but it's in Yiddish with this quintessentially Jewish word. Um, all religions are suffering in those days, to be sure. Uh, there are no less than 32 bishops, 1,560 priests, and over 7,000 monks that are killed. But Jewish clergy and religious institutions, without a nationwide church to back them up, suffered especially. Jewish communities were especially notorious in this regard. Co sorry, Jewish communists were especially notorious in this regard. During and after the Civil War, there was a compromise reached with the Russian Orthodox Church, but they never needed to do this with the Jewish church, so to speak. Uh, Jews are especially vulnerable to anti-religious oppression because Judaism for all of the advances of secular Jewish culture, and I'll speak about this some more in a few minutes, Judaism is still widely supported as an ethnicity via its religion. And besides the fact that most Jews were still ritualistically observant. Few could imagine Jewish life without ritual. Um, uh, and note also that it was far more important for the Yavsexia to suppress Jewish religion, than it was, and especially Hebrew language, than it was for the state itself early on. Uh, the state does ban all religious instruction in public schools already in 1918 and ultimately is going to restrict religion in other ways, but the Yavsexia was certainly jumping the gun. Now, education was suppressed, but not private religious observance to a certain extent. Technically speaking, to a certain extent, private religious observance was, gear was protected. But even private religious observance had consequences, which the regime deliberately kept you in the dark about. Um, so, you know, n you never knew if you were known to be observant, you could lose your job for no reason, you could have educational problems for your children. You never quite knew. They kept you in the dark, and no one holding a position of any significance could risk it. And there was an especially fierce campaign against clergymen of all, of all faiths. Uh, deprivation of civil rights, restric restrictions on rights of habitation and publicly owned buildings, discrimination in rationed food and medical aid, heavy taxation, public defamation, and for some the ultimate penalty, charges of counter-revolutionary activities which could mean arrest, prison, or deportation. That's for the clergy. So rabbis, moils, those who do circumcisions, shochets, uh, kosher slaughterers, they're being arrested. Matzah can't be baked. Uh, kosher slaughter and circumcision are, out, are, are, are not outlawed, but who's going to do them? Because the risk was too much. Uh, ritual baths also going to be shut down in the 1930s, and religious marriages basically disappear. Most of the leading scholars and the heads of the yeshivas are going to flee to Poland. Religious life is intensely persecuted throughout these years. We're in the 1920s still. And one of the things they do is they have these community trials. So uh, they're show trials. They're not real trials. They're propaganda trials. So for example, you have a witness. It's an old woman who is sending her kids to the cheder. And the rabbi there who deliberately teaches, quote, in order to keep the masses of the people in ignorance and in bondage to the bourgeoisie. And the his Talmud teaches, quote, you must kill the best among the goyim. And the Jewish bourgeois man who wants religion in order to keep the Jewish masses in slavery under capitalism, and then the judgment is rendered a death sentence on Judaism. Uh, now, one exception to this is a very interesting case, is the sixth Rebbe of Chabad Lubavitch, named uh, Yosef Schneerson, who founds the Committee of Rabbis of the USSR, which is a sort of clandestine organization from 1922 and 1930, until 1930. And the premise of the organization, he believed that, it, with some reason to believe it, that it was not the state, but rather the Yavsexia that opposed the Jewish religion. 
if one carefully followed the letter of the law, you could beat the system. He wants to unite all religious communities and institutions under a tight, centralized leadership. Uh, an individual moil, uh, an individual rabbi, an individual synagogue or mikvah or cheder could not resist the oppression of the party and the state, but a central organization could provide funds from America, above all, tactical advice, moral support, legal defense, political intervention. It's a new model for social organization of Jewish religious life, which really hadn't been centralized this way before. A lot of activities involved with, with Schneerson, but the principal one was education, the cheder. He won an official ruling that informal education of five to six boys outside of school was not illegal. And they used this to fight against attempts at closing their cheders. He printed thousands of notarized copies of this ruling and also funded the new network that was being established and even yeshivas necessary to train future rabbis. And he did, did very well for a while. In fact, even after he's arrested in 1927 and exiled, the organization continued and it kind of secured his position and the position of Lubavitch in general as a, a, the preeminent religious leader among Russian Jewry, even Mignagdic yeshivas to the extent that they existed in the 1920s in the Soviet Union, had to come for him to help. Some of them had to even start teaching Hasidism because of their dependence upon him and his support. And as a result of that period, and especially as the result of the, his successor, the last Rebbe of Lubavitch, continuing to send rabbis throughout Russia in the post-war period, uh, Lubavitch has a certain street cred in Russia that continues to this day. In any event, uh, he misjudged to a certain extent. Uh, the government campaign against religion in 1930 uh, end, ended the game. Uh, it was misconceived in his part that it was just the Yevsexia. That was true only for a few years. Ultimately, the state was never going to permit this to continue. Uh, as late as 27, uh, Hebrew books and theater could still be produced. Uh, the 1927 28 Hebrew calendar sold 75,000 copies in the Soviet Union, but that was about it. And anyway, when the Depression hit, the U.S. in 1929, the funds dried up and that was the basis of all of his success. Let's talk about cultural life for a little bit. Yefsexia are trying to agitate and win the Jews over for Bolshevism while destroying Jewish religion and the combination of, uh, the, of, the, of the war, the First World War, the Civil War, the activities of Yefsexia backed by the state, they really do effectively destroy the remnants in many ways of traditional Jewish community. But there then is producing in its place this Bolshevik Yiddish language effort. Books, newspapers, schools, even courts that are flourishing. Flourishing. So for example, but briefly, schools. Uh, between 23 and 1930, you have this growth in the number of Jewish schools, Yiddish language Bolshevik schools, and in the number of students in them. 495 Yiddish schools with 70,000 students in 1923. 800 schools with 110,000 students by 1926. And then by 1930, you have 160,000 students in 1,100 schools, mostly in Ukraine and white Russia, where over half the Jewish students are going there, uh, much, much less so in Russia itself. It's a compulsory Yiddishization during these years, only abandoned after 1928 or so. Textbooks in Yiddish produced, even several institutes of higher learning, a, a teacher's colleges, Jewish departments and universities. Uh, these actually outlive in some ways the elementary schools because the, the elementary schools started to dis disappear in the early 30s, but students had already gone through the system it continued to, to, to matriculate. These schools deliberately avoid all Jewish content, ignore all Jewish holiday, and feed an intense anti-religious propaganda uh, the famous, uh, this has been uh, produced in various films, so maybe you've seen it, where they have all the children say, okay, I want you to pray to your God for whatever you want, and children presumably pr you know, pray for him for candy, whatever it is, and then nothing happens. They say, okay, now pray to Comrade Stalin, and then the candy appears on the desk, that, that kind of thing. Um, there's a real renaissance of Jewish cultural life after 19, into the 1920s. By 1927, you have 40 Yiddish newspapers, including their Emes, The Truth, which is Pravda, right? That's the organ of the, of the Communist Party in Yiddish. Hebrew culture, even briefly tolerated. You see on the screen images from Habibima, uh, but that's going to be shut down first. Yiddish will continue much, much longer, uh, for many years longer. Yiddish theater, newspaper, 
uh, literature, even movies like the 1925 <coughs> movie Yiddish Glick, Jewish Luck, which is based on Menachem Mendel's stories of Shalom Aleichem. These artists and writers were often well paid and the books and newspapers sold in the hundreds of thousands. For a little while, the Soviet Union outstripped both Poland and the United States as the prime home of modern Yiddish culture. And artists and writers flocked to the USSR from both of those places, flocked from the West into the USSR. And we're talking about a, a, a high literature going on here, along with uh, other sorts of things, anti-religious Yiddish propaganda, uh, which is beginning in the 20s, begins to disappear by the 30s. People don't want this stuff anymore. The state is much more worried about the Nazi threat and, and, and reconciling with religion. So this stuff tends to dis disappear, and it's really a high culture that's produced. Um, some of these are Yiddish translations of Russian language materials, political, scientific, fiction, and so on. Um, and a lot of original Yiddish works as well, poetry, novels, plays, essays on literary history and criticism, and reprints of Yiddish classics uh, like Shalom Aleichem, all of these things. And this stuff is sponsored by the Yevsekzia and the Soviets. And then Yevsekzia really takes these things over and tries to promote Bolshevism uh, in Yiddish. That's the, that's the phrase, right? Socialist and content, nationalist and form. This is not the Bund. This Yevsekzia is not the Bund. Uh, very much not so. Even though it's promoting uh, a Jewish national, Jewish national uh, language and so on, it's, it's trying to, to Bolshevize them in this, in this way. Um, it reflects the state's temporary endorsement of nationality for the sake of reaching Yiddish-speaking Jews. And I love this image that you see now of the, of the Aleph base. You know, Yiddish language has a Sovietized spelling because normally in Yiddish, any word that comes from Hebrew retained its non-phonetic Hebrew spelling. And in Yiddish, that's not the case. They want to de-Hebraize Yiddish. And you can't change the vocabulary very easily, but you can change the spelling. And so, for example, the word, you see the picture on the screen, it's chaf. And the picture there is a pig. Now, the word for pig in Yiddish is chazir, it's chazir. And this is spelled like the Hebrew that it comes from. But in Soviet Yiddish spelling, they phoneticize it with a chaf instead of a ches. And the purpose of that is to dehebraize the language. And when you have the, you know, the chart for the children showing a picture of a word to sample each letter, they specifically chose the pig. And they chose it, which has both the, the ultimate level of being an, a non, you know, sort of a, a de-religionized Yiddish, but also the letter itself uh, pulling away from its original Hebrew source. And I think that really is a great symbol of this whole uh, socialist and content, nationalism form. It's nationalism form, it's Yiddish. It is Yiddish, the word for pig in Yiddish. This is, how, this is the only word that exists, uh, but they're trying to purge it of its, of its original content. Uh, the truth is, though, a lot of this culture, we know this now from recent research, a lot of this culture actually was nationalist in content. So, for example, the Moscow State Yiddish Theater, and you see some scenes from that there, attempts to do both. It, it, it attempts to do both. It does not give up on its Jewish identity. Jewish was not, not only in language and personnel. I don't just mean that there were Jews speaking Yiddish and that they were, they were Jews, but it actually addresses Jewish concerns from a Jewish perspective using Jewish symbols and Jewish history. Mark Chagall, for example, paints the walls and ceilings and does, designs sets for the theater. Uh, you know, using folk legends of East European Jewish masses, Talmudic parables of ancient wisdom, lyrical anecdotes of Zionist dreams, sacred prayers for divine intervention, and so on. They see what they are doing as being a part of the great continuum of Jewish culture, but also part of the socialist project, right? They're going to scorn the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie. They're going to lament the fate of the downtrodden masses. They're going to celebrate revolution. Uh, they're going to combine them. It's going to be nationalist and content as well, but nationalist and socialist and content, both of these things. And this is despite the pressure of socialist realism at the time. They're trying to include this Jewish uh, content. The head of the theater, Solomon Michals, uh, will also, uh, later on during the war, will lead the Jewish anti-fascist committee. He's going to be uh, uh, sadly, tragically murdered in 1948. And actually, all of the playwrights and actors and producers, they're all going to fall victim to Stalinist anti-Semitism after the war. The theater's going to be closed down. Its records, including its plays, which were never published, were burned. 
By miracle, some of it was secretly salvaged, which is how we know what we know, uh, but for the most part, they're going to be uh, killed and, and the materials destroyed. The, the problem was that for the Jews, national heritage meant celebrating a pre-Soviet reality that was beyond the Soviet Union to boot in, in many ways. And so ultimately, after the war, uh, Michal's celebration of Jewish nationality was perceived as threatening and, and anti-Soviet. Uh, productivation is also going to mean uh, agriculture, and there were attempts to uh, win the Jews over towards agriculture as a part of this campaign of Bolshevism, uh, to change them in this way. Uh, they want to, the Sexia wants to uh, destroy the shtetl by regenerating the Jews. Um, you can retain the artisan proletariat, but to productivize the others into skilled factory workers and farmers. And in fact, by 1930, about 45,000 Jewish families, 231,000 Jews, are engaged in agricultural activities throughout the USSR, mostly in the Ukraine, White Russia, and Crimea. There was a whole uh, commission for the settlement of Jews, of Jewish toilers on, on the land. Uh, this was an effort to try to change the Jews. Now, this is just before and during the period of collectivization, so it's not going to be a long-lasting solution. I think that uh, uh, the Evsexia also realized that non-territorial nationality wasn't going to have a future in the Soviet Union, and perhaps that's the reason why they started clamoring for a territory. And Stalin decided to give them that one. That is Birobijan, the Jewish Agricultural Republic of Birobijan, established in 1928, declared an autonom a Jewish autonomous region in May of 1934. Birobijan, you can see where it's at. It's an attempt at solving the Jewish national problem because their status will be clarified they would be a territorial nationality like everybody else, and also it would solve the problems of Jews living in the pale, right? Grinding impoverishment, unemployment, anti-Semitism. That was the idea. Uh, it was going to solve the Jewish problem by uh, agrarianizing them in Birr Bajan. You know, uh, Herzl uh, had declared that he didn't like this that Zionist objective of bringing the Jews back, back to the land. Well, uh, the Zionists attempted it anyway, and Stalin was going to beat them at them. He was going to out-Zion the Zionists. It had really for him, I think, great propaganda value, bringing the Jews, pioneering the new land. There were Jews already in the United States who actually went to Birobijan to live there, to take part in this grand, the grand project. It also had a certain uh, value because they were settling out in the Far East. There was a concern of Japanese ex uh, expansion to Manchuria and so on, and this was the idea was, was going to settle them on, on that border. The first contingents went out in 1928, a complete failure. There were no facilities, there was inadequate supplies, most of the people who came were forced to leave. The Jewish population of Birobajan never ever exceeded 22%, and barely a quarter of those Jews even worked in agriculture at its height. 40,000 Jews lived there. Uh, you know, it, eventually the whole commitment to agric agriculture was abandoned in favor of industrial development, and there are many reasons why it failed, but I think one of them is, why should the Jews remake themselves in Birobajan when they had a better option? Namely, they had the option of the exploding urban centers in the main Russian interior. And this brings us to the last part of today's lecture, which is the economic and social transformation going on. In 1923, at the beginning of the Soviet regime, once Poland and the Baltic states and Bessarabia are cut off, there are about two and a half, three million Jews left in the, in, in the Soviet Union. And the Jewish minority is going to adjust uh, during this new period. The economic situation is catastrophic at first, uh, especially with the majority, with the Jews being majority of petty businessmen, artisans, they are considered socially undesirable. Think about for a minute, just who's denied voting rights, at least until 1927. The categories of people who are denied voting rights in the Soviet Union include clerics, landlords, entrepreneurs employing other workers, moneylenders, innkeepers, petty shopkeepers, agents, and people without clear means of support. Again, clerics, landlords, entrepreneurs, uh, moneylenders, innkeepers, petty shopkeepers, agents, and persons without clear means of support. That's practically a list of what the Jews did for a living in Eastern Europe. And th you know, that affects actually as much as 45% of the PALS Jews and their children until they could prove economic independence. War, the period of war communism was devastating to the Jews for a variety of reasons. Uh, private trading 
uh, the destruction of private trading rather was obviously affecting them. Laws disproportionately classing uh, disproportionately class the Jews as bourgeois, which means they're more uh, subject to confiscations. They have no contacts in the villages for emergency supplies, the way Russians and Ukrainians might have enjoyed. Seventy to eighty percent of shtetl Jews had no steady livelihood. Since only a fraction found regular work, many were forced to turn to illegal trading despite the very severe penalties. When the NEPP begins in 1923-24, this helps. It ends the expropriations. It encourages private initiative. It legalizes private trading. Those who traded illegally now did so openly. Artisans reverted to previous crafts. Pogrom refugees could return to the small towns and so on. The end of the NEP, uh, especially after 1928, creates renewed hardships. In 1929, private trade, which was the occupation of nearly 40% of Russian Jewry in 1897 and still a quarter in 1926, falls to 2.3% and soon disappears altogether. So that's collapsing. But, and this is the critical, critical part of the story, it was met with the sudden investment in massive industrialization, which also opens new opportunities. We'll see Jews... 15.3% of Jews involved in industrial sector in 20, industrial sector in 26, 16.3% in 1930, but 30% by 1939. So in 1928, there was a new policy of rapid industrialization, a new policy towards the Jews. And Jews are going to take special advantage of new government clerical jobs, for example. The white collar sector, 40% of employed Jews in this sector compared to 17.2% of the general population. There's going to be a social transformation. Let's think about, first of all, urbanization. The Pale of Settlement is abolished. Leningrad, St. Petersburg, Petrograd, is going to grow to over 200,000 Jews. Moscow, which has just a few thousand Jews at the start of the Soviet Union, is going to grow to 250,000 by 1939. By that time, 87% of Soviet Jews will live in urban areas, about half of them in the 11 largest cities. There's going to be a mass migration from the shtetls, although the shtetls will survive until the Holocaust, some transformed, some actually still tradi quite traditional. The majority of Jews are, need, need to get from unproductive to useful occupations. We've seen this before, but never with the same kind of dire political consequences. This productivization, this occupational transformation along with the urbanization to industrial labor, factory workers, agriculture, administrative civil service jobs, and eventually even to liberal professions, engineers and teachers and so on. So wage and salary earners, for example, jumped from 394,000 in 1926 to 562,000 in 1930 to 787,000 in 1931 and more than 1.1 million in 1935. So to recap, 394,000 in 26, 1.1 million in 1935. More and more industries are falling under the category of government employment, and Jews were generally not discriminated against during those years. Recall what I said earlier, 40% of employed Jews in the government sector. Uh, I'll give you another example. The number of Jewish officers rises to 4.5% in 1926. At that time, 4.37% of, Belor of the officer corps was Belarusian. There were more Jews than Belarusians in the, Russia, in the Soviet officer corps, despite the fact that there were far fewer Jews in the population as a whole, obviously. 70% uh, of the dentists in Leningrad were Jewish. 59% of the pharmacists there. 39% of the doctors. 35% of the lawyers. Uh, another example, in 1939, 26.5% of Jews had a high school education compared to 7.8% overall and 8.1% of the Russians, over three and a half times their proportion in the population. The total number of university students rose from 167,000 in 1928 to 888,000 in 1939. 17% of university students in Moscow were Jewish, 19% in Leningrad, 25% in Kharkiv, 35.6% in Kiev. This is a remarkable, remarkable transformation. If you put this all together, it is, adds up to proof that by the end of the 1930s, the Jewish population had become an advanced modern society, a radically different one than just one generation earlier. And this is going to mean also the rise of assimilation and intermarriage because of the new urban exposure of millions of Jews. 
1926 already, 21% of Jewish marriages in the Russian Federation were intermarriages. This is up to 42.3% in 1936, although still much lower in the Ukraine. In 1926, already 25% of all Soviet Jews declared Russian their mother language. By 1939, it was 54.6%. A decade during which there were still Yiddish language schools and research institutes and books and newspapers and so on, over half of Soviet Jews declared Russian to be their mother tongue. Some of them might have been lying, but they were all certainly speaking it. These, germs, these Jews form a class highly committed to the revolution and to Russian culture in general. And this is going to lead, obviously, to a generation conflict. Members of the older generation uh, are going to have to accept the fate of their religion, even if they lament it terribly. And you can see it in this great story told by Edward Bagritsky in 1925. Here's what he writes, it's more of a poem, really, of his parents. Their love, their love. But what about their lice-eaten braids, their crooked, jutting-out collarbones, their pimples, their herring-smeared mouths, the curve of their horse-like necks, my parents, but growing old in twilight, hunchbacked and gnarled like savage beasts. The rusty Jews keep shaking in my face their hairy fists. You outcast, pick up your miserable suitcase. You're cursed and scorned. Get out. I'm leaving my old bed behind. Should I leave? I will. Good riddance. I don't care. That's a massive generation gap. We'll see that also in Poland. But there, the flight of young Jews will be into modern Jewish culture as much as anything else. Here, it's a flight to assimilation. And that's the reality of Sovietization. Secularization and rapid social change. Economic integration as never before, but at the cost of Judaism. And not just Judaism in the literal sense of Judaism as a religion, but Judaism in terms of Yiddishkeit, Jewishness, Jewish national culture. As Jewish national rights become curtailed, ultimately Yiddish culture is sacrificed to Sovietization and was restricted and finally completely eliminated in the 1930s. The Yefsexia also dissolved, of course. Already in the mid-1920s, it was clear that that, that, that group, that the Yefsexia, that body, had outlived its usefulness. And after 1926, the all-Russian conferences of Jewish sections no longer met. It had fulfilled its initial purpose of achieving assimilation. And not just politics, right? Russification was undermining Yiddish culture. It was, it was undermined by its own success. And finally, in 1930, the Yefsexia is dissolved. Over the course of the decade, its cultural institutions uh, similarly dissolved. And in the late 30s, during the great purge of 36, 37, 38, uh, the, the upper and middle leaders of the Yefsexia are liquidated, are murdered, uh, murdered along with, with, with uh, many, many, many others. And after 1933, Stalin basically reverses course on the question of nationalism. He now wants to build a single Russian-speaking Soviet nation. Uh, most Jewish intellectual and cultural leaders are going to be murdered in those, those purges. And there's other reasons why it wasn't going to last, besides the fact that, these, that it was being clamped from, from above. There was a real problem with the Yiddish schools, for example. There were no purely Yiddish universities and very few Yiddish high schools, and certainly not the best ones in any event. So attending a Yiddish school was going to be an impediment to advanced education. During the 30s, the state started viewing education to send children to Yiddish schools as a dangerous deviation. They didn't want education to send them to these schools. In any case, Jews are increasingly turning to Russian anyway, even before the Yiddish language cultural institutions are being suppressed in the 30s. A lot of religious Jews actually deliberately chose the Russian schools, because they were at least not geared explicitly against Judaism, as the Efsexia Jewish schools were. were. And by 1939, uh, maybe 20% of all Jewish children were left in the Yiddish schools, even in Bir uh, Obviously, Yiddish culture is going to concurrently suffer as the numbers of Yiddish readers begin to decline in the 1930s. So, in sum, the Soviet period sees integration at the price of Judaism as an organized Jewish community. Emancipation is achieved in this mass society with room for the Jews only as individuals, not as a religious or a national group. It required the ultimate regeneration, the suppression of all things Jewish. Thus, the Soviet Union initially improved the material lot of individual Jews who were willing to pay the price, but was terrible for Judaism, for Jewishness,
individual Jews willing to pay the price could achieve unprecedented heights in Russia, but, not, but at the price of Judaism in the broadest possible sense. And there are also long-term consequences for this because Jews will be associated very much with the regime, i.e. in terms of anti-Semitism. Partly this was because of the obvious advancement of hundreds of thousands of Jews, of individual Jews, people saw that. But partly it was because of the conspicuous role of some individual Jews in the regime itself. This is related to the first point because Jews are committed because of the success they achieved. The party actually monitors anti-Semitism in the 20s until about 1932 it takes measures against it. It stops after 32, but until that time it takes measures against it. I also want to comment on the link that you see on your screen now. Uh, Jeff Weidlinger um, did some research years ago in Ukraine where he interviewed the last native Yiddish speakers of the Ukraine. His interest wasn't, his, his colleague was the Yiddishist, he was interested in the history of growing up in that period. And we actually found out that there was a lot more persistence of Jewish education and Jewish culture than we realized before. It's an amazing site that I really encourage you to explore. If we had a meeting together, I would show you these links where people sing songs that they learned as child and describe how they tried to achieve a Jewish education and Jewish life even in the 1920s and 30s and into World War II. Uh, we also know that the work um, of the infrastructure laid by Schneerson does keep alive sometimes secret religious institutions throughout the whole of Russia, some legal and some not. Uh, there was hardly a town or a shtetl that didn't have some group of religious Jews keeping things alive. The Moscow synagogue itself never closed down. They kept it uh, alive as proof to foreigners of the freedom of religion in the Soviet state. But I think the fact that in 1938 the rabbi was executed for allegedly fascist ties because he sabotaged, allegedly sabotaged Birbajan and because he was selling matzah and synagogue honors in order to fund illegal haters and yeshivas. Uh, I find this remarkable for two reasons. First of all, because uh, accusing him of fascist ties at a time that we know now that Stalin was negotiating a peace treaty with Hitler is quite remarkable. But beyond that, I think it's more symbolic of the period. Yes, things persisted a bit longer than we thought, and it's quite fun to watch these videos. But in general, in the interwar period, we know that uh, first religious culture and then even the, the Bolshevik Jewish culture is all being suppressed and its leaders uh, liquidated and its materials destroyed. Individual Jews could succeed, but only if they paid this price. Anti-Semitism does not go away. Uh, popular anti-Semitism does explode in words and in violence throughout the 20s, despite the fact the state tries to suppress it. And then beginning in the late 30s, until the end of the regime in 1989, really, uh, the situation of individual Jews, uh, even those who renounce their Judaism and Jewishness, does come under attack. Uh, part of this is because beginning in 1932, there's a decree, and it's not actually about the Jews, it was actually set up for other purposes, Ukrainians above all, but there was a decree that passports of all citizens, 16 and older, has to note their nationality, and this can never be changed. If your parents are a mixed marriage, you can choose which parent, but you have to have your nationality stamped on your passport. It can never be changed. You, you can't get an apartment or work or dealing with the government unless you have this. And this is the basis of all discrimination based on nationality down the road. And Jewishness is a nationality, legally a nationality in the Soviet Union. So Jews have their nationality stamped on their papers throughout the Soviet regime. This will be the basis of discrimination, but actually paradoxically, it will also be part of the things that preserves Jewish identity in the post-war period. So it was sort of a double-edged sword. It had that other effect. Um, anyway, already in the late 30s, uh, these things, the regime's getting, not going to care so much between assimilated Jews and not assimilated Jews, and especially after the Holocaust. But this is all getting ahead of ourselves, all post-war period. Uh, so that's not, not for us for, for today. For now, we have to start moving further west. We have to come back to Galicia and to the rest of Poland and compare what was going on over there. What was that experience in the 20s and 30s? And how does it compare with the interwar experience in the Soviet Union? And we'll do that next time. See you then.